if we can make it work in a place like this, northern Kenya, um, then we can do it anywhere. Those people who work for me, they don't know what is hunger. They don't know how to buy skooma from outside because they get it from the farm. We have to take a seat back and look at where are we going because at this rate, it might become very difficult to repair what we've already done as well. Well, we have to come together on this issue. Mola talk about bariki, nasi tupate mamkuli, tushibe kama wakwasi tutulie bila wasiwasi. Rich people in the world, please don't waste food. Give to the less fortune. One type of food results to poor health. Like we unabonda pizza, sisi tunakula mandazi sirua. Yeah? Ni makwe, ni makwe. Ni pepide. What, 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 what. Northern Kenya is hot and dry. It is the home of pastoralists who depend on the sparse rain. In recent times, their large herds of livestock are destroyed by repeated droughts. And losing livestock means losing people's livelihoods. Agriculture in this region at first glance, this idea seems impossible. Nevertheless, this is exactly what is tried in a pilot project. Using a permaculture approach, enthusiasts bring life back to the soil, degraded over centuries by overgrazing and merciless sun exposure. It is also an attempt to develop alternatives in the fight against ubiquitous hunger. Agriculture experts hope that Kenya could become a pioneer in sustainable agriculture over the long term rather than blindly repeating the mistakes of developed countries. Can this approach succeed? Jackson has been with the project from the start. At first, he was unsure if they would succeed in building a stable provision of ecological food together with the locals who are almost always dependent of relief supplies. After all, this intention had nothing to do with their previous way of life. There was a very severe drought whereby cows and camels were dying, even goats. As we were driving along, we could see guys barricading the, the roads with the carcass of goats and the, uh, cows, at least to get it from the oil company or from the Red Cross. And uh, that one moved my heart and I was like, are we really going to make it here? We find that the family is made up of about uh, 10 guys, but it's only about uh, only guys, only the males who go to, uh, to herd the cattle. So the ladies are left at home. On their free time, which is, uh, I think is plenty, they should be at least doing something for food security, not just uh, waiting for meat and uh, well, I think that's the main source of food to them. But at the same time, they need greens. At the same time, they need more skills in terms of food, uh, food production to, en to enhance the food security in their community. One of Jackson's team members, Jess, was born in Kenya. She wants to show her country that there can be food diversity even in desert regions if one observes the rules of nature. It's proven, like what we're, what we're doing, it's not brain science. We're just bringing back a little bit of life by doing good with the soil and working with communities to teach them and, and putting seeds in places that have never had the opportunity to have seed. So it's, it's bizarrely simple to change the world around you, even if it is in a desert. Um, and, you know, you, you put a seed in the ground, it does all the hard work. Jess believes in traditional seeds because they have adapted to local conditions over generations. By contrast, she does not believe in modified industrial seed. She has often had bad experiences with industry seeds in remote projects. The conditions in places like northern Kenya are often extreme for the modern variations 
as they are bred to respond to specific inputs and only flourish in ideal conditions that are usually found only in greenhouses. And the easiest way to do that is to bring in indigenous seed that has shown has proven resilience to hardship or hard, uh, hard environments, you know, high pHs and there is no local pesticide shop around the corner, so that's obvious. You don't want to bring in a commercial variety that needs a fertilizer, a weed killer, a mollusk control, a soil stabilizer, you know, because no one can afford that and no one's interested in eating that. These people live off the land and you show them a bunch of chemicals that cost them their month's salary and be like, in order to eat vegetables, you need to put this on. I mean, go, go figure. There we go, there's your answer right there. <laughs> Look, I can even eat one. It does, apparently. Yeah, it works, it works. In addition to many other challenges, water is the biggest challenge for the team in the desert region and the biggest source of conflict with the local population. The young plants would wither within a few hours, but also the pastoralists' large herds of livestock rely on the precious commodity. The water supply is mostly guaranteed by a nearby well, but this is not always the case. Ivan is nervous because for several hours water emerges from the water line. He sets off to discuss the situation with the well's bosses to see when he can expect water again. We don't get water today. Uh, tomorrow will be a bit of a problem. Obviously, the constant care of the garden, you know, the, the, the systems need, need, need attention. Um, you know, we can, we can definitely go a few days without showering. That's not a problem. But um, it's generally, it's the, the whole site itself that suffers, not only us. Yeah, you can see there's uh, all the camels are, are uh, drinking. Um, so I think that's where the water is being sent to right now. Let's see where he is, huh? For today, the situation is diffused. Once the camels have been given water, it will be redirected to the farm. Ivan wants to show that people in northern Kenya do not have to depend on the delivery of food aid. With every liter of water that a goat or camel drinks, many food plants could be irrigated. Alone for the production of one kilogram of camel meat, over 20,000 liters of water are needed, and for one kilogram of goat meat, more than 8,000 liters of water. Turkana has an average of 100 to 250 mills of rain a year, uh, which that's why it's classed as arid, semi-arid. Um, it's very harsh conditions and therefore big food security issue here. People are for long times, like for big parts of the year, are struggling to feed themselves, feed their family and even feed their livestock. So there is a lot of relief, food aid, uh, different NGOs doing different stuff here, trying to you know, get them out of that. But um, it's more of a handoff handover policy or you know handouts so I think the idea of this side as well is we're trying to train community to empower themselves through knowledge and skills so when they do end up taking over they'll have they'll have they'll be able to run it without without us being here in one meter cubed we can host around 90 to 110 plants. Generally, on a meter squared on the ground, conventionally, you'd be around 10 to 15 plants. So there's a huge difference in the amount of plants we can grow. But also, it's the fact that you can really select the soil you want in. So you can put your compost and your manure all mixed together in the right ratio into your sack. So it's got really good soil and um, really water efficient. Very, I mean, we'll water them today, and then we won't water them again for three, four, five days. 
and as you can see the sun is, is really harsh. Everything dries up incredibly quickly, so these bags really retain a lot of moisture. In the project, Ivan and his friends show how the desert can grow food and free people from dependence on food relief. Upgrading the soil and the use of efficient irrigation systems are their most important tools. The original soil here is, yeah, is pretty much dead. There's, there's no, no life into it, but slowly over the last seven months we've We've been adding nutrients uh, via compost and all these organic matters we're putting on top. We want to be sustainable, but we want to be more than sustainable. Sustainability is not enough. We want to, with the community and the land, become healing forces. We want to go further than sustainability. The issue of food security is inseparably linked to the question of what we eat. For Jess, this is a major challenge of our time, where much of humanity has lost its food sovereignty. Over our history, we used to, we've eaten 80,000 different species of crops. Um, but if you take a little snapshot of where we are right now in 2018, I think 19% of humanity is living off nine staples. And it's just 80,000 to nine in less than 100 years. Like, go figure, go figure, yeah. We've just lost all those different strains um, because we're focused on the one super apple that is perfectly round and can fit into our supermarkets. And it's like, well, what if that doesn't grow in an area that's suddenly been affected by climate change? Now we can't eat apples. Jess is confident that Kenya could lead the way if people did not perceive their traditional ways of eating as backward but superior. By returning, the country could achieve its own food security. We have an opportunity to be global players as opposed to this kind of subservient country that's so backwards and, and you know, hopeless and needs so much help. Like, man, we've got, we've, we've got this window of opportunity to come up on top and prove to the rest of the world that we are in charge of our own future for our own people and this is how we're going to do it. And it's reliant on these, so much on these traditional values and beliefs and food systems and connection to the earth. We haven't lost it yet. So why, why let that go to, to welcome you know, the development model that, that, is, that is largely failed everywhere else? The project is effective. Fast fruits are harvested, nature recovers, and lost species come back. Jackson, Jess, Ivan and their comrades show that global food security does not have to depend on only one industry-wide solution, but that many opportunities lie with individual-specific adjustments. Over the last seven months, we've had over 20 indigenous birds come back. Uh, there's butterflies, there's bees, there's insects. There's the bad ones, the good ones, the balance is coming back, so we're, we're bringing back biodiversity. Rejecting the use of pesticides is hard to the team's concept of health. This makes them part of a global movement that more and more people are joining. If Kenya wants to export fruits and vegetables to Europe, how crops are grown and cared for is of increasing importance. The European Union is a key market for horticultural produce from Kenya and in the country at least 9.8 billion rand a year. 
Recently, however, horticultural consignments from Kenya have been rejected. The export market for fresh vegetables is important for Kenya because Europe is one of the recipients with growing shares and interests in raw organic produce. Since consumers are very concerned about their health, there are special rules for producers. The European Union protects itself with high standards of importation and pays strict attention to pesticide residues in vegetables. If the residue limits are exceeded, it would undermine Kenya's export potential. Therefore, Kenyan companies often have their vegetables examined in laboratories for pesticide residues. Again and again, it is found that these are too high. However, this does not mean that the products will inevitably be destroyed. Instead, they often end up in the local market where controls are non-existent as reported in media. Professor Mbaria from the Department of Public Health hopes for a change in his country. He knows that the rules for export to Europe are strict because consumers are critical there. He also hopes for the same high standards of food safety in his own country. So, I don't think they are doing enough to ensure that the food that is available is really safe. And, uh, that is something that uh, we need to, even the national government needs to take that into consideration. Because uh, yes, we, the food could be there, but is it of good quality? Could it be responsible for the increase in diseases like cancer and other problems that are health problems that are affecting the local community. Enlightened consumers in Kenya who know about the dangers of pesticide residues on their fruits and vegetables go shopping in the organic market. They are the minority as the division of land areas show. Less than 1% is managed organically. Even in the capital Nairobi, there are few places where consumers can buy organic, ecologically grown produce. For organic market leader Dennis Andai, one of the biggest questions is how to convince the local population of the added value of organic products and move these products out of a niche market that, right now, is only accessible to wealthy consumers. Uh, from what you can see in our market, um, most of the clients, the people that believe in this, the people that come every week, are not, are not typical Kenyans, let me put it that way. Uh, they're not people like me, you know, it's more of the expert community, it's more the people from the West, Americans, you know, it could be Germans, it could be Dutch, it could be people from the UK, um, not typical Kenyans. The reason why most Kenyans don't show up or don't come to buy from these farmers, I really don't know. I don't have the answers as to why they are not coming to shop. From Dennis's point of view, it is not only the price that is prohibited, but also the lack of awareness among consumers about the dangers lacking on the vegetables and also the impact that non-organic farming has on Kenya's natural environment. He himself is motivated to advocate for organic farming and the development of organic farmer markets because of a personal experience which he suffered. I was hit by an autoimmune disease that um, nearly killed me. And by the time it was discovered, I was in a wheelchair, I had lost so much weight, I was like 38 kilos, you know, I was barely bones. I think the chances of me surviving were very minimal. I was like just getting closer to my, to my death. And the drugs started destroying my organs and my pancreas was the first one. So in this case, I developed induced diabetes and for me, that was the moment. But then I'm thinking there's a way yeah. what you guys are doing yeah. and what it does. One day, I ran into a line that said I could manage the condition by eating organic. And as an adult, I asked myself, what is organic, you know? And I, I didn't understand what it was. We can produce food organically. If we have issues to do with the soil, we've got to get friendlier products and improve our soil. If it's issues to do with pests, friendlier methods can be used to deal with pests. These things are not happening. These things are not happening. So. We really have to 
we have to take a seat back and look at where are we going because at this rate it might become very difficult to repair what we've already done as wrong. For many farmers, the decision to switch to organic farming is a financial blessing and often results in higher yields, since the ecological methods they use don't cost much and in the long run reduce the expenditure while also increasing surplus for market sales. To, to control pests is very important, but within the within the area where you want to do organic farming, you need to have a boulder of herbs which can uh, uh, stop pests investi investing in uh, uh, getting into a land. Kamano Kihari has taken over his three hectares of land from his parents. And since the beginning, he has been using organic farming methods that he was shown decades ago. He has a clear answer to the question of food security, crop diversity. When you, are, when you have maize in small quantities, the, in terms of armyworms, not many you come. And then the, you see the restrictions. They are, they are, they are main, they, there is not a maize field all through, acres and acres of it. So it did not affect us very much. Wow. Those people who work for me, they don't know what is hunger. They don't know how to buy skooma from outside because they get it from the farm. And it is there regularly. A certain section can be empty, but the whole farm cannot be empty. I have about five seasons, all in one. I have something in Asari. I think you saw something germinating. That's broker and cowry. It's germinating. I have something in the, uh, in the nursery which is once transplanting. I have something which I transplanted two weeks ago. There's something which I've transplanted about a month. That's a big one. About two months. And what I'm eating. I don't disturb the marot. I just check whether there is potato and whether it is big enough. If it's not big enough, I, I leave it. If it is big enough, that's the time I remove it. My family, my immediate family, we are about 20. M immediate family. I have five workers who has their own kids. 80% of what they consume come from the farm. That is on our own consumption. Wherever that food is there, they eat. If there is no meat, they can eat the potato. If the potato is not there, they can eat the sweet potato. If it is not there, they can eat the, the banana. That's a change. But they are all, they are vegetables all the time, skuma, spinach, all the time there is. So for their stewing, there's no problem throughout the year. Kamano is one of the few farmers who is able to grow crops whole year around because he invested in an irrigation system that is able to maintain thanks to a nearby river. Only a few farmers prioritize basic means of securing water sources. In Kenya, less than 3% of arable land is irrigated, even if research shows that due to irrigation, maize harvest could be doubled. We don't need the chemicals, we don't need the fertilizers, but you cannot produce anything because there's no water. Uh, from the tarmac up to there, I think there are five or six people with irrigation systems. Are those irrigation systems going throughout the year? Not many are going throughout the year. So, and we need irrigation for, for somebody to sustain himself throughout the year. Or you live near uh, the riverbed, where you can use the water, the watering can, manual, manual watering. That one again you can sustain, but not many people can do that. The multiple interrelated causes of hunger must be investigated if we are going to fight it and find a lasting solution for all. In a monoculture, one can never harvest all year around. The greatest possible diversity is therefore essential for sustainable food security. For the small farmers and the government of Kenya, it is not too late to restore, invest in, and amplify the use of traditional cultivation methods using indigenous seeds and where farming with nature is the end goal.
It is also up to the consumer to demand a variety of food grown in an ecological and sustainable way and not to just reach out for the perfect round and shining apple. We've seen it with the plastic ban. They said no more plastics. And truly, people are not doing plastics. If today the government says, we are all going to go organic, trust me, we will go organic, because whoever doesn't will be prosecuted. But it's not, it's not for their interest. Probably because it's big business, seed business, chemical business, fertilizer business, and things like that, and these companies would definitely marry any government of the day. So probably it's got to start there. If truly our government loves its people, we've got, they've got to step in. Otherwise, these will be left to people like me, individuals.